this week, we're going to continue in verse 14. And, um, and here's, the, here's the kind of the heading, if you have headings in your Bible. This one, mine says, faith without good deeds is dead. So we're going to talk about faith and works or faith and deeds. So let's read, it to, let's read it. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show up by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. So when we when we break this chapter down and we look at this, this is a constant, this is another place where we have to be cautious that the enemy will try to divide us. Because you have the party that says, it's not about works. And then you have the party that says, faith, you know, it, I mean, one party talks about the works, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. The other party says it's all about faith. It's all about faith. And here's what we're going to talk about today is it's not one or the other. It's both. It's both. James is not contradicting the scripture that Paul writes, and we'll have it up here. Uh, Put up Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. See, Paul's not contradicting James, and James is not contradicting Paul, but here's what Paul says in Ephesians. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. So you talk about, when we talk about, you know, the the one translation that a lot of us are probably familiar with if you grew up in the church, it says, for by grace have you been saved through faith, not of yourselves. Then it says, not, it's, it's not by works. It's not by works. So in some ways, this can look like it's contradicting what James is saying, because James is saying you can't have faith without works. So let me try to paint this picture to help you understand that they're both, they both should happen. Because when you read Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says it's not of works, lest any man should boast. When you read verse 10, verse 10 of that same chapter says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he's already planned. So we're saved by grace, and we do good works. But works are still involved in faith. But your works is not how you gain salvation. It's, you don't work to get this place of faith. But works is still in the picture. It's not in the front. It's in the back. So in other words... You don't have works for salvation, but when your faith in God happens, there will be works. And if there's not, then you got to check something here because a changed life will do things different. When you surrender your life to Jesus, your life will look different. So you can't just say, yeah, it's, you know, my faith just makes me 
exactly what I need to be and who I need to be. Listen, if your faith is true faith in God, it will result in action, in works, in fruit, however you want to look at it. There will be things that happen because of your walk with God. So it's not contradicting. It's just understanding the works don't make you saved, but being saved brings about works. Does that make sense? Kind of getting a better picture there? Let's look a little bit about faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this. Faith shows a reality of what we hope for, but is the evidence of things we can't see. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things we don't see. So <clears throat> our faith is, is believing something even without seeing it. You know, when we come in here in the morning and we turn these lights on, we just trust they're going to come on. We can't see how they come on. We just trust. You trust that that chair you're sitting in was going to hold you. I don't think any of you got down and looked, make sure all the screws were tight, cushions were fastened. I think you just trusted and had faith that it's going to hold you. And you sat down. So there's, there's a lot of places that we, we show faith and you believe things even when you don't see it. I mean, how many have ever seen an actual manifestation of God? Like God just came down in, in your room or as an angel or something. And I'm not saying people haven't. I know for me, I've never seen God in like a natural setting. But I completely know that, that he's God and that he's, the, he's real. So it's our faith that believes the things even when we don't, when we don't see it. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that we have to have faith because it's impossible to please God without it. So the things that you're believing, the things that you believe in God and all that stuff, you have to have a place that you trust and believe in God. So that means there's going to be times in your life that you have to believe without seeing because that's, that's, it's impossible to please God without having those times. That's why I tell people all the time, like when, when you're facing a decision, and I have faced those decisions, and we'll continue to, and you will face them, when you don't know what tomorrow looks like, and you don't know what this outcome of this is going to be, you just have to trust that God knows. And my belief in God causes me to still be at peace in walking through a, a situation or a difficulty knowing, God, you got this. And I'm going to trust you. But I always, and we all do, would like to know as many facts as possible. Because it's easier to believe if you see it. It is. I mean, it's, it's easier. If you say, listen, you know, um, I just believe God's going to provide for me. But you're not seeing it yet. You're not seeing money coming in. You're not seeing a job offer. You're not seeing certain things. And it's hard to believe that God's going to take care of you when you're not seeing the things. But that's where faith comes in, where you say, even when I don't see yet, I still believe that God's doing something, and that this is going to happen. So faith is necessary in our Christian, in our Christian life. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we live by believing and not by seeing. We walk by faith, not by sight. So faith is important. All right, and that's kind of what I'm setting up. Faith is a very, very, very important part of your life. The faith that you have, your faith, your belief in God, that's, it's crucial. Because you will, you can, you can talk all you want to talk but you will live out based on what you believe. You will live by what you believe. You will not live by what you say. Because you can say all day, you know, I hit, here's a kind of an illustration. There is a, when I was in Bible college, and I, I don't know if I've ever told this or not, but um, I was not the model student in Bible college. I'll just get that out of the way. Um, I didn't manage my time well. I like to have a lot of fun. I wasn't rebellious. I just... Um, yeah, anyway, it's not even important to go there. The bottom line is, one, so this one particular night, uh, we had not managed our time well, and we're, um, well, all of a sudden, we have a test the next day, and it's a big test, and I've not studied at all, and it's the night before, and I have no idea any of the stuff that I'm going to need to know for this test. So it's about 10, 11 o'clock, and... Um, we come in, and there's me and three other guys, and they're like, man, we got to study. 
Well, because of some stuff that had gone on before, we were supposed to be in our rooms, lights out at 11 o'clock, which you would think as a college student, you shouldn't have to do that. Well, there was reasons why we had to do that. Um, so <laughs> I'll just leave it there. But anyway, so we're all, the four of us are sitting in the, in the lobby area of the dorm, and the RAs come out and said, hey, y'all need, to, y'all need to go to bed. And so we were like, man, listen, I, I love you, bro. I know you're trying to help. I know you're RA, but I got to pass this test tomorrow. So whatever, whatever happens, I just got to pass this test. So we're, gonna, we're just going to study. He's like, y'all need to go. And so, we're, so we're basically saying no. Like, we're, <laughs> we're going to study. And they're saying go to bed. We're like, no. I know you want us to, and we probably should, but we're going to study. And so, so what they're supposed to do when they encounter rebellious people, <laughs> however you call us, they were going to call the dorm supervisor who lives in the apartments, him and his wife, and he oversees, like, all dorm stuff and um, student life stuff. And so they're like, well, we're going to call Clint, and he's going he's gonna to have to come up here. And I was like, all right. So we're sitting here, and we're all talking about, like, oh, we're going to get in so much trouble. But, hey, man, I'll, I'll take the punishment to get a C, you know, or a B, you know. It's rarely I saw an A, but I was like, I'll take whatever I can get, but I got to at least study a little bit. And um, so he calls Clint. So Clint's, you know, going to drive up. And there was one particular guy, his name was Tim, and if you're listening, Tim, you know who you are, buddy. And um, so Tim literally says this. He goes, I don't care what Clint says, I'm not going to bed. I have to get this study in there. And I was like, yeah, I, I understand, man. I think we're all in that place. But Tim is the most boisterous one. He's like, I, don't, I mean, I ain't trying to be rebellious, but I'm a grown man. I got to study. And I got, you know, and he's just like, he is working himself up and he's letting all of us know how big bad Tim is. Tim's like, I don't care what he says. I will be up here all night if I have to. And so he's just going on and on. So uh, Clint walks in and uh, tells Tim, he said, hey, what's going on? And he's like, man, we got a test. And so we're all telling him we got a test. And Clint looks at Tim and says, Tim, I need you to go to bed. He's like, yes, sir. And he packs up and he just walks, <laughs> he walks and I was sitting there, I was cracking up laughing. I was like, what? Mr. Tough Guy? Mr. I don't care what he says. I ain't going to bed. Tim, go to bed. Yes, sir. And off to bed he goes. And he fails his test. Um, I don't know if he failed or not. But he, uh, he just takes off. Well, here's, I, I just thought it was hilarious. I mean, I just thought. But I also thought, oh, that's probably the right thing to do. And I probably should have done that. But I won't tell you what, that, what happened with the rest of us. But Tim, because that's not the illustration. The illustration is that Tim talked a good game. Tim talked about how strong he was going to be and how he was going to stand up for what he felt was right. He had to get this study, and he talked and talked. But then all of a sudden, the pressure's on, and what he said is not what he did. Now think scripturally. Remember when Peter tells Jesus, I will not deny you. I will die for you. If they want to come get you, no way. He's the one that hacked the dude's ear off when they came to get Jesus. He was the one that said, I'll die for you. He, he, convinced, he was convincing himself and Jesus that Jesus was wrong when he said, you'll deny me. Yet what happens when, when Peter is faced with people saying that now Jesus is arrested and now people got him knowing that he's in trouble if he identifies with Jesus. And the thing he said he wasn't going to do He did. And that's why we got to be careful to say, listen, it's not about what we say that we're going to do or what we say we're not going to do. The real issue is you will know where you stand on something when you're put in a situation. No matter what you say, your belief system will be what you act on. You will act on what you believe. If you believe something is dangerous, you won't do it. If you believe something is, is going to be good and fun and, and it's what you need, then you'll do that. It's all about what you really believe. So it's not just about talking. It's about walking by faith even when you don't see it. And it's not just what you say that needs to come out. So faith and works both are vital. And that's what James is saying. Don't get caught up in just 
You know, I have faith and that's all it is. You just talk this great game and everything's by faith and everything's by faith, but nothing ever works into any action or deeds or works towards being a blessing to other people or helping others or encouraging others. They both need to happen. Works and deeds are a result of genuine faith. It just, it's, it's going to happen. So James is saying, look, don't, don't get on the side. They both, they both need to happen. It's kind of like, um, I don't know what, the, we call them seesaws. You know what those are? Those little seesaws. That's only fun with two people. You ever got on a seesaw or a teeter-totter, whatever they're called? You ever got on one of those by yourself? It is not fun. It's not. When you're a kid and you're playing at the playground, you know, and you, me and my brother, you know, we're on a seesaw, we're like, wee, wee. And then one of us doesn't want to play anymore. Then whoever gets off, hopefully when they get off, the other person knows. Otherwise, they come slamming to the ground, and that's not fun. But other than that, like if someone, if, 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 if no one's on the other side, then you don't really get to play. And it's the same way. Like, it's not about one or the other. They're both necessary in your Christian walk. To live it out, they're both necessary. When you paddle a canoe or a kayak or whatever, or, you know, but think about when you're in a, a canoe and you're paddling or you're rowing, right? What happens if you just row one? You just spin. And then you take that one out and you row the other one by itself. What do you do? You just go in circles the other way. So if you're all about just faith, it's all about, it's just about faith. It's just about faith. You're spinning in circles. If all your whole life is like, I'm just wanna, I just want to do the right thing. It's all about works. It's all, you spin in circles. But we understand your belief in God is how you're saved by grace through your faith in God. But that will result in works coming along to where not only do you believe, but your belief has changed the way you live. And that's where you make progress, when you have both of those. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? They're both necessary. Um, so look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. When we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being un uncircumcised it says what is important, and, and that then would be like a work of fulfilling the law. But it was saying now is what is important is faith expressing itself in love. So you're going to see here that faith expresses itself somehow. And in this translation, in this verse, it's expressed in love, which means your faith produces love. Faith works by love. So faith shows itself by love. The Bible says in John, um, it says that they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. In other words, they'll know that you believe in me and that you're a follower of Jesus because of your love for people. You can't, you can't truly love Jesus and hate people. There's something wrong. Something shorted out somewhere. Something's not right. Because the proof of your love for God and your faith in him will be shown by your love for others. Not miracles, not prophecy, none of, none of this. It's shown by your love. That's, that's, how, that's one of the expressions of it. So we have to look and say, you know what, how can I see these things? How can faith be expressed? How can, there needs to be something that comes out of my faith life. Something that came, comes out of my journey with Jesus to help me see that there's something different. Listen, more than ever, the world today, we should be standing out way more than we are. Because you have a lot of angry, hurt people in this world that don't know where to turn. And we have Jesus. We should be people that are walking that people are like, man, how are you so peaceful? Well, let me tell you. And opportunities to share the Lord with others. Just because they see something different. 
Listen, I'm going to be honest. Like, I am just now starting to recognize how easily we can lose our joy. Not that it's taken from us. We have it. It's a fruit of the Spirit, and you have the Spirit of God with you. But through all this season we've been through, with COVID and everything, there was a season. I didn't even realize it, but it was just like, I'm just trying to get through it. And I realized just a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was praying, I was reading, and I was like, man, you know, I've, I've not walked in joy like I used to. And I had to look at that and say, you know what, joy should be a part of what comes out of my life, even in difficult moments. So I had to do my own work with the Lord. So God, I want to, I want, I want to walk in joy again. Like, a deep joy. I don't want to just say it. How many grew up in church? You've been in church for at least, okay. Wow, okay. Um, but we used to say, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. In my heart. Right? And you know how many, I, I, I saw people all through. I got the joy, 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 joy down there. And they don't have it, but they're talking about it. And they're singing. And we joke about it, but but it happens. And you encourage others, hey, man, joy of the Lord is your strength, bro. But you're miserable. Listen, true joy will manifest in your life, and it will be seen. Because your talk does nothing if it's not your walk. If you're not living it, people pick up on that. And I, I myself, and have even talked to, uh, I was talking to Chris the other day because something came up about it. And I was like, you know, we just have to make sure that we keep our joy through, all, through everything. Through challenges, through difficulties, through the COVID stuff, all that that went on. So many people lost their joy. But you know what's weird? is they stopped walking in joy, but they had the source of joy that never left them. Think about that. How many people didn't walk in joy through this COVID stuff and through all the, and I know there is some stu- tough stuff that happened. People lost their jobs and, and people became homeschoolers and, you know, that weren't signed up for it. Like, you were forced into homeschooling, and you didn't know how, and you didn't have resources, and you're just like, I, I, I can't, how do I teach my kids stuff that I don't even know? Like, all that. But yet, the source of joy in us, which is the Spirit of God, was with us the whole time. But somehow, allowing it to manifest, we missed. And that's the things that we got we to gotta recognize and say, listen, we don't, it's not a before the faith, it's not like we try to produce joy. It's we recognize that we have the Spirit of God with, uh, within us. And we believe and we trust. And out of that comes joy. And then you can literally sing, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart with a smile on your face. And now people aren't saying, like, really? Now they're like, dude, that dude is joyful. And he he's walking through difficulty, but he's keeping his joy. And that's that's part of how we need to see things. We need to look and say, is our faith producing? Are we seeing godly things in our life as a result of our faith? And we should. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. So part of your faith is recognizing that the Lord is with you. And it says, test yourself. So look. And listen, this, it's so easy to, we talked about this before, it's easier to look out a window than it is a mirror because when you look at a window, you're focusing on others. You look in a mirror, you're focusing on you. But this scripture is saying, look at you. Look at you. Where, how is your faith right now? So in order to test it, to see how is it, look at what your, how your life is. How is your life? What are you, what are you walking out? What do you see what do you see in your life that shows you what you believe and where your faith is? Look at it and let the Lord reveal to you. Philippians 2.12 says this, and this is 
something we need to know. Dear friends, you always followed instructions well when I was with you, and now that I am away, is it even more important? Uh, then it says this, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Not work hard for salvation. Okay, You're not working to get saved. You are saved. But work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. So the results of your um, faith and your salvation is how you walk it out in obedience to whatever God says. And, and how do we walk that out? Well, it, it varies with each person because it's obedience to what God is saying to you. If God's speaking to you right now about a, about a certain issue, then that's the area that you need to look and say, God, I want, I want to walk this out with you. I want to be obedient to what you're asking me to do, even if it's difficult, even if it's challenging. How do I, how do I walk this out? How do I walk this journey out? And then Titus 3 verse 8 says this, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God, okay, all those who have faith, will devote themselves to doing good. So again, it's not to make you right with God, but because you are in right standing with God, these things follow you. These things happen that you do good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. So let's just give the one example. There was a couple of examples in there. I'm going to give you one example um, as we kind of prepare to wrap up. But in, Galatians, in Genesis 15, verse 6, here's what it says about Abraham. And it was in the scripture of James as well. But this is where it came from. Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. So in James, it talked about Abraham believed God, and it was righteous, and he was counted righteous because of his belief. So it wasn't because of works. He wasn't righteous because of works. He wasn't, it, but it was because of his belief. However, belief results in works. So true belief has works with it. So let's look at this passage in Genesis chapter 22. And I'm going to read, um, going to read the whole passage to you. Um, so if we can go ahead and put Genesis chapter 2. It says, sometimes later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. Go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. Now, as we get ready to read this, let me just give you this up to date, okay? So God promises, this Isaac is a promise from God. And in that promise, the Lord said, listen, his descendants will be like the, you know, will be like a lot. Like the sands on the ocean. I mean, there's a, this, he will have these descendants and this is what it will be. And God had given him this word about Isaac and what was going to come from that line of Isaac. All right, so you with me? It says, the next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and he took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out to the place God told him about. So listen, Abraham's doing some work. He's cutting wood. I mean, he's not just like, well, we'll see. I mean, he is. He's doing some work. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. And listen to what he says. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there. And then we will come right back. Now, remember, he's going to sacrifice his son. As of right now, he's going up there to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulder. And see, this is, can you imagine? It's like, as a dad, you're thinking, okay, I'm offering my son as a burnt offering. I'm even going to make him carry the wood. So Isaac has no idea what's in store. But so Isaac's shoulder, while he himself carried the fire and the knife, and the two of them, Walked on together. Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, we have the fire and we have the wood. Where's the sheep for the burnt offering? Now, let's, we all know that a lot of us know this story. But just before you go too far in the story, just put yourself in Isaac's place. And Abraham's. 
Put yourself in their place like, oh, dad, I'm, I don't see any kind of animal. I'm carrying this wood. We got fire. We got, got a knife. Where's the sacrifice? So you know stuff's starting to go on in his head, right? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked together. When they arrived at the place where God had told them, remember this, Abraham said that. God did not say to him before, go offer your son, and I'll provide a sheep. There's a reason why Samuel, why Abraham said that. We'll get to that. Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, now be Isaac. What are you feeling now? You're like, my dad, I mean, you know, Abraham was older, right? When he, so he's like, okay. Dad thinks I'm a sheep. I mean, like, Dad, what do you mean God told you to take me out? Like, what are you talking about? But yet, here's Isaac tied on the altar with no idea that there's going to be intervention. And then I wasn't told by anyone that there would be intervention. Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So he took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yahweh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use the name as a proverb. On this mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I'll multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Then they return back to the servants um, where Abraham uh, continued to live, and then we'll just, we'll just stop there. But here's, here's, the, here's what happened. Abraham knew there was a promise for Isaac. But Abraham knew God, and Abraham believed God. So when God told Abraham to do something, there was something in Abraham that acted in obedience and walked out everything that God said, even when it didn't make sense. But the reason he could is because there was something that he knew, that he believed God, that he knew God would provide. And if you read in Hebrews 11, it talks about in that what we call the Hall of Faith scriptures, where it talks about by faith, by faith, it talks about Abraham. And it says that. It says that he knew that God would provide or that God would raise Isaac from the dead because there was a plan for him. But he was willing to go through and do what God said, even when it went against what he thought. But because he knew God, he walked it out. He walked it out. And God, God came through. God came through, always does. So when, when your faith is tested, and it will be. When you go through things and you see things and you're like, you know, it's one thing to say, I believe. But that belief is going to be tested at some point. I believe God provides. That's going to be tested when, when you need provision. I believe, you know, I believe God is the source of all my strength. When I, well, then that's going to be tested in the place when you're weak. I believe that God heals. That's going to be tested when, you're in a, when you face the time where you need healing. I believe God, you know, that, that God hears me when I pray, that God hears me when I call on him. You believe that, then you'll call on him because you know he hears you and you know he'll help you. But I can't tell you how many times in my life, I grew up in church. I was at every church function 
I was at more church functions than, I mean, than I ever could count. And I could tell you story after story about the Bible. I could tell you story after story about what's right and what I learned and all these great things. But I will tell you this, that some of the faith that James talks about being dead faith is when it's just knowledge, but it doesn't produce anything. And I can tell you from growing up, I knew a lot of scriptures and I had a good upbringing in things in, in scripture. But I also know that there were certain things that until I was put in the situation, I didn't know what I believed. And then all of a sudden I thought, okay, you know what? I do believe. Or, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of in panic mode now. So I thought I believed that no matter what happens, I'll trust you. No matter what happens, God, you got this. And now I'm in a situation I'm like, ah! I'm like, maybe I don't really believe it yet. So I want to encourage you, and, and James's encouragement, it isn't about trying to manufacture works. It's not trying to just learn how to do good things. It's not talking about works. It's talking about faith with works. That's different. You cannot believe in anything and go do stuff. But faith with work says, you know what, God, I see you, and I believe in you, and I, I love you, and I'm in relationship with you, and I know you love me. And based on this relationship, I'm changing, and it's being seen in how I walk my life out. That's the works that comes from my faith in God. And I close with this verse in Matthew chapter 5. Very familiar. It says this. It says, you're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp, then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And then this verse, in the same way, let your good deeds shine for all to see so that everyone will praise who? Yeah. See, that's the difference. The good works that you produce because of your faith in God those good works, people will see and they will recognize that comes from a higher power. For you to be able to love someone who did that to you, for you to be able to forgive somebody who did that to you, for you to be able to, to welcome someone who doesn't act, look, or smell, or anything like you, for you to be able to be at peace when all the world around us is falling apart, for you to be able to live this way, with all of this around us, that's not you. There's something different. And I'm telling you, that's, that's the greatest form of evangelism right there. The greatest form of evangelism isn't standing on the, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this if anybody does it, but it's not standing on the street corner preaching and telling people, turn or burn, liars or friars, whatever. I'm not saying any of that. You know what the healthiest thing is? The healthiest thing is to live a life of love and kindness and acceptance and peace and be different and let the light of Jesus in you shine that when all the world is compromising and doing other things to either try to fit in or to try to get by or to try to cover their hurts or to try to, you know, ease their pain or do whatever, instead of trying to find all this stuff out there, find it in Jesus. And when you do that, I'm telling you, people are going to be attracted to that. People are going to be attracted to it. And they're going to say, there is something different about that guy. I want that to be said of me. All. I want people to know when that, when that day comes that I'm gone from here and I'm with Jesus. And I hope that's, I mean, I'm with Jesus now, but I, you know, I'm not looking to go anywhere anytime soon. But I'm saying if. The day when I go be with the Lord, I want people saying, man, Scott, he was different. People say that anyway. Let me specify. <laughs> In the sense of their walk with God, like Scott was different than the world. Man, he loved people. He accepted people. He, 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 he stood for what he believed, but in such a way that he honored those and loved those people that maybe didn't believe the same way. Or didn't see the same thing. He didn't judge and condemn and shame people. He was different. 
his light was bright. Because people see in the world, in the dark world, you will stand out. Boy, if this was, if it was just pitch dark in here, I mean, just dark, dark, dark. And you just turn your little flashlight on your phone. Just that little light. Do you know everybody in here would see it? Everybody would see it. Because it would overtake darkness. It would stand out. Darkness couldn't hide it. You'd see it. That's how our Christian walk should be. We should have faith in God that results in a life that is transformed. And when our life is transformed, people see it and people recognize it and people say, how in the world is that happening? Where is that joy coming from? Where is that peace coming from? Where is that purpose of life coming from? And we point them to Jesus because that's what it says. Your good deeds, let it shine so people see the good deeds, but they glorify God. In other words, that's not Scott. Scott was different because he had Jesus. That's what made him different. That's what we all need. Amen? Amen.